Now that we are familiar with the architecture of Android, how the Android operating system boots up, and the multitude of partitions that can exist on Android, let us step into the forensics part of our course. So you're a forensic investigator called in to offer your expertise on handling the suspect's Android mobile device. Where do you start from? In this video, we will talk about the steps to be taken while responding to an incident involving an Android mobile device. At the time of purchase, mobile devices are indistinguishable from each other. They all have a fancy metal body accentuated by powerful cameras and other embellishments. From the moment a person starts using it, that mobile device can be likened to that person's personal diary, almost even a fingerprint. Various studies show that on average, a human spends about three to four hours of their entire day only on their smartphone. Data transferred back and forth between the user and the device customizes the data enough to affiliate the user with the device. In an incident involving an Android mobile phone, there is a good chance that the device holds data relevant to the case at hand. Only experienced qualified professionals should be allowed to deal with the device, consequently gleaning potential evidence from it. For this reason, it is vital to secure the device from the moment of seizure until it is in the hands of a qualified forensic examiner for further analysis. Now let us discuss the steps that can be taken by the incident responder to secure the device. Gloves must be worn throughout the incident response process. If the device is physically lying in a location, first, high quality photographs must be taken of the device and its surrounding areas. Measurement scales may be used to help with perspective during analysis. If the device is handed to the incident responder by an onlooker, the responder must make sure to collect the contact details of that onlooker who may be called in for interrogation as seen fit. If the device is handed to the incident responder by someone else on the team, then information must be obtained about where the device was found. If the device is present in a corporate location, then the incident responder must advise the system administrator to lock the system accounts of all people who may have used the device. This is because those systems may contain information relevant to the case. The incident responder then can proceed to collect data from the systems. Once the device is in the incident responder's hands, the state of the device should be analyzed. If any unique markings are found on the device, it should be photographed and documented. Some devices have small buttons to function as status switches. The state of those switches should also be photographed and documented. To keep their state from changing, protective tape can be placed on the switches. Slots for headphone jacks, USB ports can also be protected with tape. Next, it should be noted if the device is locked or unlocked. If the device is found unlocked, the responder can navigate to the settings menu and check if a PIN, password or pattern security mechanism is in place for the device. If there is no existing security mechanism, then the device can be placed in airplane mode. This is to cut off all network connectivity of the device, inclusive of Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, cellular, and NFC. This also eliminates the possibility 
of the perpetrator remotely wiping the device. Putting a device in airplane mode only modifies its system settings. It does not damage the user data in any way. So the responder interacting with the device in this way is acceptable. Then the device can be placed in anti-static bags to protect the hardware from any damage. We will talk about these anti-static bags in a bit. If the device does have a security mechanism in place, the responder can query if the owner of the device is in the vicinity. If the owner is nearby and is willing to provide the PIN, password or pattern, then the device's settings can be changed by removing all security mechanisms, thereby unlocking the device permanently. Then the device can be put in airplane mode and placed inside an anti-static bag. If the device owner is not nearby or is not willing to provide the password even under coercion, then this action may be attempted. In the settings menu in the about phone section, there would be an entry called build number. Tapping this entry seven times would enable a new menu in the settings called developer options. Here, there is an option called stay awake. When this option is enabled, the device's screen will stay awake when the device is charging. The device would be unlocked, connect the device to a portable power source and keep the device unlocked. Then put the device in airplane mode and place it in an anti-static bag. You can take a moment to let this sink in. Let's see what the responder can do when the device is found in locked state. If the device's owner is nearby and is willing to provide the credentials, the existing security mechanisms can be removed, the device would be permanently unlocked, following which the device can be put in airplane mode and bagged. In case the owner is not around or is not willing to reveal details about the security mechanisms used, the responder can check if it is possible to place the device in airplane mode by selecting the airplane icon in the drop-down notification panel. If yes, then the device can be placed in airplane mode and bagged. Some newer devices disallow this to prevent any changes to the device when it is locked. In this case, the network connectivity of the device would be active. To prevent the device from interacting with any network, it can be kept in a special bag called Signal Isolation Bag or Faraday Bag. It also prevents the perpetrator from remotely wiping the device. You can find a PDF version of this flowchart attached at the end of the video. Now, talking about bags to store evidence. So far, we have encountered two types of bags anti-static and signal isolation bags. Let me point out the uniqueness of the two. First, we'll talk about anti-static bags, starting with what static really means. You might have experienced this. After combing your hair, if you take that comb near a piece of paper, the paper would attempt to stick to the comb. Let us see how this happens. Every object on Earth has equal number of positive and negative charges. Before using the comb, the charges on the comb, hair and paper are neutral. This means there are equal number of positive and negative charges on each of the objects. After combing, the charges on the comb and hair undergo some rearrangement. All the negative charges from both objects stay on the comb 
while all the positive charges from both objects stay on the head. The disorientation of charges on the comb and hair is referred to as static. When a negatively charged comb is brought near neutrally charged paper, the positive charges on the paper get attracted to the negative charges on the comb. The comb attempts to neutralize its charges, which made the comb attract the paper. This phenomenon is referred to as electrostatic discharge. Although the paper was not an active participant in the combing activity, it was affected by the negatively charged comb. Now, considering electronic devices, or mobile devices for that matter, if such static or electrostatic discharge happens, it may damage the data on the device. For this reason, whenever Android mobile devices are acquired from a scene, after initial response, they are immediately stored in anti-static bags, which prevent charge imbalances from occurring within the device. There are two types of anti-static bags. The first type is formally called dissipative anti-static bag. This type of anti-static bag prevents the buildup of static on any device. The charges on the device stored in the bag would remain neutral. These bags are usually available in pink or red. However, if a positively or negatively charged device is brought near the dissipative anti-static bag, the item stored in the bag would still be susceptible to electrostatic discharge like the piece of paper. This bag protects the device from the inside, but cannot protect the device from external unequally charged sources. The second type of anti-static bag, referred to as conductive anti-static bag, can prevent the buildup of static and also prevent electrostatic discharge. It is usually silver or gray in color. Anti-static bag is a blanket term for both types of bags. Usually, conductive anti-static bags are a better choice to protect the collected evidence. Another type of bag to store evidence is the Faraday bag or signal isolation bag. When a device is placed in this bag, all its network connectivity is cut off from the outside and the device is truly isolated. Every piece of evidence bag would have some information on a peripheral sticker. It would have details of the incident responder who collected the evidence, date and time of collection, where the evidence was collected, serial number of item, case number which this piece of evidence is relevant to, etc. There would also be a chain of custody section which details the names of all the people who come into contact with the evidence and when. From the incident responder to the team of forensic investigators who handle the evidence. It is the path taken by the evidence from the time of seizure to the time it is presented in court. The evidence in anti static bags or Faraday bags are further stored in cardboard boxes or paper bags and then transported to the laboratory for processing. Plastic boxes should be avoided for storage as they may cause a buildup of humidity. Once the device of interest is stored properly, look around in the vicinity for any other interesting pieces of evidence like device cables, memory cards or USB drives. Any such items if found can also be bagged as evidence. Look around for any handwritten notes, stickers or notebooks that may contain pins or passwords. They may be the key to accessing the data of certain applications on the device. 
Remember to take photographs of all evidence as they appear before collecting it. Once the incident responder collected all relevant evidence, bagged and tagged them, it is transported to the forensic laboratory for processing. Throughout the incident response process, the incident responder must make notes of all the activities performed from the time the device was sighted. After reaching the laboratory, the incident responder must hand over all the evidence and notes to be kept safe until investigators are available to process it. Evidence safe is the location where all evidence coming into the laboratory would be stored. Evidence custodian is the person who oversees the evidence safe. The incident responder's duty for the case concludes the moment evidence is deposited in the evidence safe. Control transfers to the forensic investigators.